Hello, and welcome to the Collective Church Podcast. These messages are from our Sunday services at the Collective Church in Boise, Idaho. If you are new with us or just checking us out, please visit our website at collectivechurch.org. We would love to hear from you and connect with you. We pray that this message is both uplifting and encouraging. Grab your Bibles. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Uh, we've got the lights turned up, as you all might notice. Uh, I, uh, at 48, uh, I'm supposed to wear glasses, and I, re- I just refuse to. Um, it's, it's a fatal flaw, uh, so resisting. But I want to be able to see you better, so that's why the lights are up. Uh, we've been in a, a series titled Unfinished for a couple weeks now. This is actually week five. I'm really excited for the journey we've been taking through the book of Philippians. Uh, there's a, a key verse um, in there that talks about the, the good work that God has begun, that he is faithful to bring to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. This underlying message in that uh, text is that we are unfinished. That's really good news because you're not who you used to be and you're not yet who you're, you're going to be. And I love the invitation for us to continue to grow uh, to become more and more Christ-like, this reality that was a, a Hebrew way of thinking that really all of creation is unfinished. And so we're a part of that. And so this journey is to help that development in our lives. And most of that happens in a relational sort of way. So I want to talk about three things today. I want to offer a few thoughts on fear, uh, faith, and then freedom are the three kind of emphasis we're going to have in this. So In Philippians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 12, and I'll have this on the screen as well. I'm going to read the text that we're going to cover today, and then we're going to dive in with a few thoughts. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me was actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Now, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that uh, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former, well, they preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether for, from false motive or true, that Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I Uh, And I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. This is the text we're going to cover today, and there's a lot happening here. And here's what we're going to circle around today. That spiritual maturity can be measured by what it takes to move you from living a life of faith into a life motivated by fear. Your spiritual maturity could be measured by what it takes to move you from faith to fear. And so Paul is pushing in on this reality. Now, here's what's important to understand, that faith and fear, they're both rooted in the unknown. Uh, But the outcomes of living in faith and living in fear couldn't be further apart. Both motivated by something out in front of us, But depending on how you choose to live and what motivates you most will have very different, radically different outcomes in your life. See, one is anchored in heaven and the other is anchored in hell. Faith is anchored in this superior reality of heaven and fear is anchored in this inferior reality of hell. Faith and fear are two very different ways to live our life. It's no wonder that the most repeated command in the Bible, as you may be well aware of, is some version of fear not, do not be afraid. Over roughly 365, depending on the translation, times that command is repeated. That's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not a request. Hey, it might be better for you if you chose not to. God says, do not be afraid. 
There's so much in our world to be fearful of, so much that wants to undermine our um, security and our safety or our confidence, particularly in, in Jesus. And so we're reminded continuously, do not fear. Why? Well, I mean, the primary tactic of the enemy and the weapon that he chooses to use to disconnect us from the source of life and sideline us is fear. That is the tactic and the weapon that he chooses to use to come at you, your heart and your mind. And here's, here's why this is important, because uh, he is, uh, the Bible tells us, the, the father of lies, right? It's the language he speaks. It's the only way he communicates to you. There has never been a word coming out of his mouth that is truth. And so when he speaks, and if you listen and agree with that lie, you find yourself empowering an inferior way of living your life. That's what happens because lies undermine the very foundation of faith that we're called to live in. That's what lies do. Fear is the, fear in the present is primarily about the problems of tomorrow. It's unknown, right? But faith in the present is primarily about the possibilities of tomorrow, very different ways to live, right? There are things uh, in your life that will happen tomorrow that are out of your control. Actually, everything about tomorrow is out of your control today. The challenge is we spend more time worrying and wondering in the wrong sorts of ways what tomorrow might hold, and we miss out on the present opportunities that are provided for us today. And see, how we respond to the things happening today, they prepare us for what is coming next in our tomorrows. The, the challenge we face is that, that fear embraces this woefully inferior reality, leaning on primarily our own understanding, right? We try to figure it out before it happens. We, we do not like the unknown. We loathe the mystery. And so we want all the answers. Fear embraces that inferior reality in our lives. Faith, on the other hand, it, faith uh, gives us the capacity to embrace an, a, a superior reality, primarily resisting that temptation to lean on our own understanding and acknowledging or submitting to God. That's what, that's what it says in um, Proverbs, very familiar, maybe famous passage in the Bible. Trust in the Lord with, what does that say? All. Any idea what all means in the Hebrew language? It, it means all. Yeah, it, it, there's no like, oh yeah, it could mean this or that. It means like unequivocally everything in your life, all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in what? All your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Another translation says he will put you on the right path as if there are, there's a, a path that we are currently on and the path that we're walking may or may not be God's highest and best for your life. The challenge is we want to root our direction in an inferior reality or wisdom oftentimes and it feels like this is the direction I should be going. But when we're willing to say, okay, hold on a minute. I wanna lean not on my own understanding and that can come from my limited knowledge in the present and my even experience in the past and say, maybe there's a better option. When I resist the temptation to do the former, the latter uh, is the result of my life, where I find myself, the paths being straightened out, or he, him putting me on the right path. I mean, some of us today need our paths straightened out. We've, we've been leaning too much on our own understanding, and the result of that is more rooted in fear rather than faith. See, fear, it, what it does is it, it's not a matter of will we trust or not, but what fear does is it shifts the place where we put our trust. Does that make sense? Fear shifts the place that we put our trust. So we can, in fear, put our trust in our uh, 501c, uh, no, our uh, 401k. <laughs> That's the thing I'm looking for. <laughs> uh, we can put our, our trust in our bank account. We can put our trust in our talents or our abilities or our strengths. We could put our, our trust in uh, someone else and miss the opportunity to actually put our trust in the only place that can produce the kind of life that we were created to live. See, faith anchors our trust in the right place. 
in God, the God in whose image you're created, in that superior realm called heaven where there is a wisdom that does flow. Fear, though, keeps us up at night. Anybody else? Faith? Like when you operate in faith, have you ever noticed how much easier it is to rest? Your, your mind can actually take a pause. I mean, how many of you have lost sleep over some sort of worry, anxiety, or fear? Maybe last night, even. Well, here's the good news. You already know how to meditate. Because if you can fixate on that, you can shift the focus to meditate on something else. I mean, we, we know how to meditate, and we're good at it. We can uh, have our mind consumed by all the wrong sorts of things and uh, realize that we have not been at rest for a really long time for this, that, or the other reason. And you name it, you fill in the blank. Up all night thinking about that thing, that person, wondering, worrying, A little bit later in this letter that Paul writes to the church in Philippi, um, he, he has this idea. I mean, it's not his own. It's generated from the wisdom of heaven. And he says this, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, meditate on such things. I love this passage because if you back up a couple verses in it, it says, rejoice always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And then he says, and finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is, and he gives us this list of things to focus on, to meditate on, because there are things that want to consume your thought life. And if you let an inferior way or a lie get rooted into your mind because it wasn't taken captive and made obedient to Christ, it begins to take root in your heart. Let me just say, it's a lot easier to get it out here than it is to get it out here. It still comes out, it has to come out by the authority of Jesus, but, it, but when it gets in and begins to take root, you feel it a whole lot different. So Paul reminds us that there's another way we can think. And yet, what I discover is that we allow fear to linger longer than we should, largely because it's familiar. You ever notice that? Well, like, if I'm not gonna fear, then what, then what am I gonna do? I mean, if I don't have that, then what do I have? It's been for so long the weapon and the tactic of the enemy that it's a familiar way in which we operate. But it's important to note that you can't just not live in fear. You can't just wake up one day and go, you know what, it's not gonna happen. I'm just choosing to not live in fear. I'm gonna guard my heart and I'm gonna guard my mind and I'm not gonna allow fear in. Because there's an empty space there. The moment you... you you resist the temptation to um, fall prey to fear, there is something that has to fill the void. And so we can't just not live in fear. Something has to take its place. Faith is the option for us. Jack Hayford once said this, how would you treat a friend who lied to you as often as your fears do? It's a good question. How would you treat a friend who lies to you as often as your fears do? It was, uh, and I, I, you know, the source of this is a bit uh, sketchy, but Winston Churchill was, has been uh, credited uh, with a, uh, a statement uh, towards the end of his life. Someone had asked him, do you have any regrets? A man who accomplished a lot in his life, do you have any regrets? And he said, oh, I do. I had many troubles most of which never happened. Oh, that's what fear does. It monopolizes and consumes our thought life and paralyzes us from moving forward. 
Last week, we looked at the prayer that Paul wrote to the church. He said, this is my prayer for you. And it starts off by saying that your love may abound more and more. That's how the prayer starts. My prayer is that your love, your agape, your action-oriented essence of who you were created to be and motivated by love, that it would abound more and more. That's how he starts it. Now, in another place, uh, 1 John chapter 4, I'm going to read this to you, 16 through 20. There, there's, uh, John, the, the author of this is the, the, the disciple that Jesus loved. I like, I like how John uh, associates that. He's like, no, listen, above everybody else, I'm the one Jesus loved. What I love about John is he's just communicating what all of us have the permission to communicate. I'm the disciple that Jesus loves. Right? He's just willing to say it, you know? Uh, but this is a guy who walked intimately with Jesus. And it says this And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. I love this. So I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. There, there is this difference between uh, Christ in us and us in Christ. Those are two different, it's not the same way, it's not uh, two different ways to say the same thing. And, and John reminds us of that again here. See, sometimes Christ, listen, Christ in us gets us to heaven. And we choose to live in Christ, we actually see heaven crash here into earth. Because it's a way of living that resists the temptation to operate in this place of fear. It's this continual accessibility to the faith that we've been given. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how we know love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. And then here it is. That perfect love that comes from the Father, what it does is it dislodges and it drives out fear. That's what love does. Love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. See, love, this perfect love that we've been given, here's what it does. It creates the context for living in faith. Love becomes the foundation that drives out fear that gives us the opportunity to have faith. When, when love does that work, when we allow love to do that work, to drive out the fear, we're then free, free to live in faith. See, they, th- th- there's this incredible interplay that happens in each one of our lives between fear and faith and freedom. Fear gives us no ability to live in this place of freedom. Love drives out that fear so that we can now throw off that yoke of slavery that is familiar to us and then gives us the capacity, opportunity, competency even in Christ to live from a place of faith. But sometimes in order for us to begin this process, you know what we have to do? We have to begin to declare things that are not as though they are. We have to begin to declare those things that are not as though they are. And some would call that actually speaking like our father. See, because he sees things from a very different vantage point than, than we do. We can get stuck in this place of fear. And it, what, it do, what it does is fear causes us to live this really small life and to, to see only a, a few inches before our face. We get stuck in this place. Faith, on the other hand, can see way further down the road. But sometimes we have to begin to declare in the middle of this uncertainty and the unknown and the confusion or what even may feel like chaos, the truth over the lies. And if we're not willing to begin to declare those things, we're gonna find ourselves stuck in the place longer than we, sh- than we should be. There, there's the truth that we have access to. There's the lies that we have access to. And then there's declaring the truth before their reality. There are things that are true about our life right now, here today, each one of your lives. There are things and lies maybe that you're believing currently or you've uh, been tempted to take hold of. 
And then there's the ability for you to believe the truth, to believe the lie, or to begin to declare the truth before that truth becomes a reality in your life. That's a powerful thing. Words, words are significant. There's a reason it says, in the beginning, God created. And when he opened his mouth, when he uttered the words, creation burst forth. The, the chaos, the formlessness begin to take shape. So we have to begin to declare these things because here, here's the thing, the enemy cannot read your thoughts. He can give you a thought, which is unfortunate. He can't read what you're thinking but he hears what you're saying. And so the moment you agree with a lie and you, you communicate that, yeah, listen, I, it's, it's never gonna happen in my life. No one is ever gonna love me. I'm gonna be stuck in this place forever. I'm always going to struggle. But right? you fill in the blank. The moment you utter those words, guess who hears them? And what it does is it takes the focus off of his impending doom and reminds you, or he's wanting to remind you of uh, your inability to live as God intended you to live. We have to begin to declare things that are true before they become a reality and resist the temptation to speak out those lies. Here's what happens when we do that. We, we initiate this thing um, that we see throughout the Bible called breakthrough in our lives. When we declare these things, we initiate, we um, open up realms of opportunity that we now have access to when we declare those things. And breakthrough is initiated in that process. There's this moment uh, that God is speaking to the, the prophet in the Old Testament, Joel, and it says this, Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war, he says. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the, here it is, let the weak say, I am strong. Let the weak, that's their current condition, let the weak begin to declare something that is true that is not yet a reality in their life. Let the weak say, I am strong. That word strong is a powerful word in the Hebrew language. It means to prevail, to have strength, to be strong, be powerful, mighty, or great. Like I know this is not how you feel right now, and I know this is not your current context, but it can be. Let, let those who are weak declare, I am strong. Now, when God speaks this, he isn't saying you be strong in your own strength. He's saying there is a strength that you have access to that you have to begin to take hold of. It's his strength. He's the one that makes us strong. We could even say this, this word, strong, has to do with breakthrough in our life. Let the weak declare breakthrough before it actually becomes a reality. No, 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 this is not my lot in life. I don't have to stay in this place. This isn't God's best for me. There's more. I wanna remind us this morning that we are created for victory. Do you know that? You weren't created for defeat. Defeat is a, is a natural byproduct of rebellion in God's good created order. But you were created for victory and you can still live in that place even when it doesn't seem possible or it feels far off. Let the weak say, I am strong. Faith positions us for a move of God. What fear does is it contributes to our own demise. And the moment you agree with that, you empower this inferior way of thinking that distorts and poisons your mind. Here's a couple thoughts. 
fear causes you to live a really, really small life, right? I mentioned this, I think, last week. If you're afraid of people, right, what do you do? You, you stay alone. If you're terrified of being alone, you're always around people. If you're afraid of heights, you stay low. If you're afraid of water, you move inland, right? There's all sorts of ways in which we mid, try to mitigate the fear, but anytime you try to mitigate the fear, guess what it does is it shrinks your life because the fear isn't being dealt with or destroyed. It's being pushed away, but it's still there. Fear attracts an inferior way of thinking. I've already mentioned that. It limits your influence to this space right here. That's what fear does. We think from this, the smallest place we can live. Fear poisons us. Now, faith, on the other hand, doesn't poison, it empowers. That's what faith does. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's what the Bible tells us. Faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain about what you do not see. Faith and fear are all about the future and about the unknowns. And the difference is, well, how will we choose to live? Faith positions you to live from, I would say, the most limited life possible. That's what faith does. Faith positions you to take risks you would never take in fear. Does that make sense? Ever. There's no chance. I mean, your whole, your whole deal is to, uh, to be risk averse in fear. But what faith does is it positions you to, to step into these risky, maybe even sort of reckless kind of things from the world's perspective. And then faith gives you access to a whole different realm of influence, heaven. So I want to take us back now uh, to Paul for a minute. It seems strange from earth's perspective that someone in chains would be interested in proclaiming faith and freedom. I mean, this isn't Paul's first rodeo. And he has been through it. And it would be easy to live in fear. Paul's not far from the end of his life. And uh, the church history, or history, tells us that Paul was beheaded by the emperor Nero. And what church history tells us is that, and most would contend, it was because of other contentious Christians. Other people who didn't like, were opposed to, wanted what he had, you name it. That was the, the motivator and influencer that propelled Nero to summon and then execute. And here's Paul. Paul knowing life is short, proclaiming this freedom and faith from prison. See, for Paul, though, freedom wasn't about his geographic location. It was much greater than that for Paul. It can include your geographic location, but it does not have to. How does someone in prison, in chains, proclaim freedom? Well, Paul understood that that perfect love drives out fear that creates the context for he to be someone who lives in faith. And you know what faith does, similar to fear, is it impacts everybody around you, everybody, in your sphere of influence, within your reach. Maybe you know those people. Maybe you, maybe you are those people who operate in faith or in fear. You've watched it happen in, in your sphere of influence. Or, or maybe you've been influenced by those people who live in faith or live in fear. But there is no freedom in that place called fear. In another place, another book, letter that Paul writes to the church um, uh, in Galatia, he says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. That yoke of slavery is all about the fear. 
Don't let now operating out of this place called the good news that has given you access because love has driven out the fear that you used to live in and now you're functioning in this place of faith. Do not again allow that yoke of fear and slavery to come in and cause you to live this small life again. That's the temptation because it's familiar. We, and I, I, we have to desire to live in freedom far more than the enemy's desire to keep us captive. Because that's his default. I, I wonder how much freedom we want. And sometimes we're like, oh, I've gotten a measure of freedom. This is great. You know, I got a little runway here. Boom, and then you bump into something. I mean, do we want the freedom that's available for us? Do we want to live for all that Christ died for? Check this out. A little bit later in chapter one, we'll get here maybe next week. Um, But it says, whatever happens, Paul writes, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I I come and see you Uh, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being fearful in any way by those who oppose you. This or such fearlessness is another translation, is a sign to them, the enemy, those who oppose the forces of darkness, that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved. That, that is such a profound verse that Paul writes to them. What the enemy wants to do is he wants to take the target off of him. He doesn't want to be reminded that his impending doom is on the way. And so in order for him to ignore that, he shifts the focus to you. And if he can get you to operate in fear in an inferior way of living and thinking and functioning in this world, then he is perpetuating that in our lives shifting the focus from him to them, to us. So the temptation is always in front of us. And it's the primary tactic of the enemy. It's fear to influence our lives to live in an inferior way at every turn. Faith, though, here's the thing about that passage. Faith, on the other hand, what it does is it reminds, victory reminds the devil of the impending doom. It's this flag, if you will, that we wave, this victory reminding him that he does not win. And it feels like that at times. Like, does anybody see this? Can anybody do anything about it? I mean, these cries seem to fall on deaf ears. That's right. No one cares. And we find ourselves retreating into the dark recesses of our own heart and mind and being subject to the influence of the enemy. But you're created for victory. And when you declare victory, when it feels like defeat, it isn't fake, it's faith. And the enemy hates it because in that moment, he realizes that the target has been turned back to him. We have to begin to declare these places of victory and breakthrough in our lives. Some of you know that uh, we have three kids. Um, Moses is 14, Jonah's about to turn eight, and Bella is four our two boys are uh, uh, adopted, uh, Moses from Congo, Jonas from Haiti. Both our boys have Down syndrome. And over the past several years, we have had what's felt like a really epic battle with his health. The long story really short, he got strep some years back, and the strep was never stripped or destroyed in his body. And what strep can do, at least from what we've been told, is it creates inflammation in the body, but also in the brain. And so the longer it sticks around, the more inflammation can happen, the more problems actually are present. And so we've been at this for, for years, several years, trying to, trying to get our boy back. You know, in the throes of it, you're like, you know, it just, I mean, 
it, it's easy, you know, just throw up your hands and go, it is what it is. You know, we've, we've done all, all we can do. I, I don't know if we're ever going to. There are times where it just feels like defeat. But then we, we get the opportunity to begin to declare victory and breakthrough in his life and in ours, for our family. Like, wait, you mean it doesn't have to stay this way? No, it doesn't. You can believe the lie that it's never gonna get any better or be any different. You, you, could, you could believe that and it will cause you to, to be paralyzed and stay in the place that you're in. Or, or we can begin to declare victory and breakthrough over his life and say, there, there's more. We're not gonna give up. I feel like I, I've been in both of those places. Like, ah, what we're doing doesn't seem to be working. Now what? And I have this faith-filled wife who says, no, I think you're not paying attention. Oh, it's working. We're getting our boy back. And then that perspective from my spouse is so important because then I can go, oh yeah. See, I look for the, I don't know, the magic pill, I guess. I don't know where it goes from where he is now to where we want him to be. But we forget sometimes that there's a work that God's doing in our life that takes longer than we would like. And at times it feels like it takes God a long time to act suddenly. And what we need in that moment isn't more fear, it's faith. Faith about the future. I'm gonna, I'm gonna not cover uh, this next section just because of the sake of time. I wanna, I wanna ask this morning, where this section goes is where Paul is talking about, uh, yeah, some preach out of envy and rivalry and yeah, others out of goodwill and, Paul says, well, what does it matter? You know, so I'll just very briefly unpack it. And Paul refuses in this moment. You, you would think like Paul's like, well, what does it matter? Who cares? As long as Christ is preached. And this is a guy who knew every jot and tittle letter of the law, right? This is a guy who had been beaten and stoned, you know, 40, 40 lashes minus one multiple times, shipwrecked starving. And here he is going, why does it matter? As long as Christ is preached. You know, what, you know what he's doing here in this moment? He's refusing to get entangled in an inferior way of functioning. It would appear maybe from a zoomed out version that the church is more concerned about the color of carpet than the reality that people are dying and going to hell. It's like, yeah, 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 no. I gotta keep the first things first. I gotta make sure I prioritize. Jesus said, I've come to seek and save the lost, not to help you decide which color your chairs or carpet or how the lighting will be in your building. Great, that's fine, I'm glad you have them. We form committees that form committees that form other committees. When people are dying and going to hell come to seek and save the lost. Here's what I've discovered in my life, that, that I, can't, I can't help someone um, step into a relationship with Jesus unless I have a heart for the lost. And I wonder where the church, and I don't mean us specifically, where, where the church stands on this. Are we terrified of the culture around us? That we're gonna be forced or coerced or are we a people of faith? I love when Jesus in this moment, he says, when, when the, you ready for this? When the son of man returns, I wonder if he will find faith on the earth. What's he saying? Well, I know how most of us operate in this place of fear, but I wanna see people who operate in faith. Anybody else? Is there anything today that has been motivating your life that is associated with fear or worry or anxiety in any sort of way. Let 
Me too. Isn't it high time we allow perfect love to drive that out? Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this message and would like to learn more, you can join us in person or online for services at 10 a.m. on Sundays. We would also love to connect with you. You can fill out a connect card on our website at collectivechurch.org and also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube.